Welcome to this week's Insta session. Uh, my name is Matt Abbott. I formed the label Nymphs and Fugs five years ago last month. Um, and basically I just wanted to start a weekly Insta session just because it's something I really enjoy. I love the fact that I can invite poets from all over the UK and there's no hassle with travel and accommodation. I love the fact that it's really relaxed and it's great content for us to upload. And yeah, we're just trying to make the most of the situation really. And so basically what I'm going to do is every week I'm inviting some of my favourite poets to join us for this session. It's relaxed performances, uh, relaxed relax conversations and hopefully some nice relaxed viewing for you lot on a, on a Tuesday night. Uh, so coming up soon we've got Iona Lee who is a poet and illustrator for, uh, based in Glasgow. She's also front woman of the band Acolyte who are like a, a jazz poetry fusion band, a beat poetry band. Sorry, um, she's probably going to dig me out for that. I, I don't know where that came from. Uh, like a beat poetry band. And uh, Iona's fantastic. She performed at the first ever Livewire event in London in December 2016. Um, and I'm really excited to join her. Uh, next week, just so you know, we've got Stephen Lightbone uh, next week joining us. So um, I'm going to see if Iona is up for joining us. How do I do it? I think I do that. Yes, that's the one. I'm still getting to grips with this technology. Just inviting Iona to join us now. It's baking up today, isn't it? It's right sunny. Makes it a lot harder staying indoors. Here we go. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? You all right? Yeah, I'm okay. How are I've, you? I've just invented an absolutely dreadful uh, musical genre. I, I, I started describing your band, and I, I know it's beat poetry, and I think I said something like jazz poetry fusion, and so That's I okay. apologise for sort of not, not, not bigging you up properly. Well, how would you describe it? Oh, I found it very hard to describe it because we're sort of making it up as we go along, but I've sort of settled on poetic effusions and witchy nonsense, something ah, like that. Okay. I don't know. I remember that. Um, <laughs> thanks for joining us. How are you doing? You all right? Yeah, I'm okay. Um, I mean, obviously kind of going through the ups and downs that we all are, but generally I'm not having a bad time. Yeah. yeah. Are, you, are you sort of putting yourself under any pressure to be creative or are you just taking each day as it comes or? I'm writing timetables and not adhering to them. Right. <laughs> what, like giving yourself a daily like timetable for each day, like a task list and like a work thing? Yeah, well, I mean, honestly, it's not been too different. The, the thing that's very different is that I'm not doing gigs, you know, two or three nights a week. But other yeah. than that, I've not had a like proper job for about four years. So, yeah. you know, it's not too different. And I'm I'm not very used to having a routine anyway. Yeah. So I'm sort of setting out like Monday, I'll write for two hours and then go on a cycle or whatever. And by by Tuesday or Wednesday, kind of sacked it off. <laughs> Fair play. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> obviously when you're a freelancer, particularly when you're a freelance artist, we're sort of used to working from home and having a blank calendar anyway, aren't we? So it's yeah. we naturally will either fill the calendar with admin, like create a project or just mm -hmm. toss it off, like you say. So no, it's nice. I'm, I'm the same as you. I'm, I'm trying to set work schedules, but like a half day is more than enough in it, in these yeah. circumstances, I think. <laughs> and, Especially when you're not working to a particular goal. Like I've got a few things that I'm doing stuff particularly for, but you're like, well, Wednesday's free. Shall I write a book on Wednesday or something? You know, you've just got the like empty space and, I think sometimes when you timetable yourself, you, you're at risk of like just sitting there feeling the pressure of having to make something, but having no idea what that thing might be. Yeah. So you have yeah. these moments of like, maybe I want to write a graphic novel. And then you're like, no, I don't want to write a graphic novel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can't pro you can't timetable creativity. Can you, you can't be like, I'm going to, I'm definitely going to be able to write a poem at four o'clock on Wednesday. Mm. Like it's impossible. <laughs> you just don't know. <laughs> But, um, yeah, I like I the more romantic idea that like the muse takes you, like you have to go with yeah. it, which means that I spend a lot of time watching YouTube videos, not doing anything. But if if a muse does take you and you don't have any deadlines elsewhere and you don't really, you know, you don't have a workshop to prepare for, you don't have to leave for a gig, it is a lot easier to just go, right, that's what I'm doing. The muse has taken me, I'm just going to write. I guess it's mm. easier to do that without the pressure of, oh, I really should do that, actually. Have you mm. found that um, you've, you're writing if you have been doing writing, that it's changed at all, or, like, the poetry that you're reading is different? Like, as a result of your lockdown mindset, if that makes sense. I mean, I'm seeing everyone's lockdown poetry on Instagram and Twitter. 
Um, so that's different. Uh, I wouldn't say that what I'm writing has changed much. I've written one or two, you know, cursory lockdown poems, but generally it's not been that different. Like I said, my life is not that different. Like I graduated from art school uh, at the start of last summer and then spent all summer doing festivals. And then I moved to the Isle of Iona, which is what I'm named after, to work in a hotel for two months. And then, so since I came back from there, which was November, I didn't have a job and was just kind of hanging about the house every day and sort of writing a bit and drawing a bit. And then I just got a job in a club and was like, right, <laughs> this is me. I'm going to have a normal job two or three days a week. I got a studio. I was like, I'm going to work in the studio. This is me doing proper life for the summer. And then this happened. So I've been kind of just at home every day since November. Right. So, yeah. So it's, not too different. it's just, yeah. I guess, easier to save a bit of money when all the pubs are shut. That's the yes. main benefit for me, I think. <laughs> that, that's true. It's kind of embarrassing looking at my bank balance being like, wow, where's all this money come from? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, oh, the <laughs> Cool. Um, so, do you fancy f reading a poem? Sure. I printed out some. Wow. Uh, Decent. I know, I never do that. Uh, I'll start with this. Cool. This is called uh, Balancing. Uh, it was inspired by a poem by John Osborne, the same title. Nice. On a slow day in the pub, I asked Steve if that is when he felt the most like a chef when he did the knife thing, where he took big strokes sharpening his knives in a macho display of chefness. He said, yes, but also when he chopped things very fast. I thought and said that I probably felt the most like a waiter when I balanced two plates on each arm. You can't really get away with a teacloth over one shoulder anymore, but I suppose that bartenders could have twiddling the bottle opener. I wonder if ball boys feel very much like ball boys when they run fast and pick up a tennis ball. I wonder if bankers look at themselves in the mirror and think, I am a banker, as they do up their ties. Something happens when you zip up that Sainsbury's fleece or clip on that name tag. Look at me behind the counter. Look at me playing the role of helpful shop assistant. Tonight, Matthew, I will be sports center lifeguard. With my knees and my whistle, I shall be glorious. I shall sit atop a very high chair and try to look like I know exactly what I am doing. <laughs> I like that a lot. What, when do you feel you're most a poet? When, when do you feel you're most poety? Most poety? Uh, yeah. When I'm writing on a typewriter. Right, nice. Is that like a yeah. final draft thing? Or, or do you ever try and frush it out on a typewriter first time? Uh, no, it's more just sort of to, because it looks nice, isn't it? Yeah. I don't know, yeah, it's, it's something like that. It's like, if I wrote with a quill, I'd probably feel my most poetic then, but like, no one does that, so. I mean, typewriter is pretty, pretty old school. I know. Pretty cool. I know. I've got it right here, I'll show you. Oh, wow. I've got some of your prints that you did a few years ago that are, oh, it's beautiful, that. That are like, um, like chunks of poetry really neatly put in the center of a page and they do look beautiful. Mm -hmm. I yeah, no, I, uh, I did what well, is called communication design, which has the banner, it, it like involves kind of photography, animation, illustration and graphic design. Yeah. And uh, one of the good things about where I went, Glasgow School of Art, was that they had a really good like typesetting facility. So I, oh. I've never been like hugely into typography, but I definitely kind of got an appreciation for it when I was yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Do you find that your illustration work ever informs your poetry or vice versa? Um, yes and no. I mean, they kind of like do battle in my head a bit because when I'm writing a poem, I've got a really strong sense of what it looks like in my head. Yeah. And when I'm trying to draw something, I've got a really strong sense of how I would describe it. So like they kind of complement each other and also kind of get in the way of each other, I think. Yeah, right, right, right. Okay. Because you've, I've, I, did you put something online recently saying that you'd be up for illustrating somebody's, did you say like a kid's poetry book? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I mean, I'm up for illustrating anything all the time, really. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I was just doing some stuff for myself that I didn't have any words for, but just felt like uh, 
would fit being a children's picture book. Nice. Yeah, so That's I just cool. sort of put it out there. <laughs> Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm sort of envious in a way that you've got the other art form to bounce it against. Because I, I, I don't know about you, but because you write lyrics as well, right? Mm. Um, so sometimes I guess I know that lyrics and poetry can be quite similar, but writing for a different project it can help to bounce between two, can't it? Say if you're working on your pamphlet and an EP, for example, it's two different headspaces. Does that make sense to you as well? Like, of course. Do you find that you write something and you're like, that's a song, or that's a poem or um, is it do you figure it out other ways I, I I think I'm a little bit braver when I'm writing lyrics in songs because I feel like because it's backed up by the music it's maybe not as obvious like a poem's very naked in it hmm. like that's it whereas sometimes with a song I'll be like not that I don't want people to pay attention but I feel like because there's a music as well I'm I feel a little bit braver but yeah it's weird isn't it jumping between the two um, I see what you mean I think also though, I feel like I have to be less abstract with lyrics because yeah. it, like it can be a bit more straightforward because the the melody is doing so much of the work that the metaphors and the the imagery would be doing in a poem. Like the, the music goes right past the thinking bit of your brain and right into the feeling bit. Like you can hear a song that's got no words in it and know what it's about yeah. kind of implicitly. So the lyrics like they can be a bit more straightforward, you know? Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. See, I've, I, once, I sometimes think the opposite in that you can get away with it because even if you don't get it first time, we're enjoying the music and then we listen to a song a few times more and pick up a lyric or as with a poem. If you're listening to a poem and we don't get it, it's just like, well, that's just because I'm mm. too scared to be subtle mm. in my poems. Um, anyways, it's not about me. It's about you. So <laughs> can you remember that, that you did the first ever Livewire gig in December 2016? Yeah, yeah, I remember it well. <laughs> mm -hmm. we had, what was uh, the name of that place it was in Soho yeah it was a it was a cellar wasn't it a, like a basement venue in Soho yeah I remember it was underground and it was full of paintings yeah 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 and we had a, an award ceremony and a raffle yeah, yeah 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 that was an odd night but yeah that was the first one god that's like that's three and a half years ago that's nuts in it yeah I remember you had longer hair and glasses then I only just longer hair with this lockdown shite mare that's going on, but yeah, yeah, I have long hair and glasses. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, cool. Uh, do you fancy giving us another poem? Sure. Um, cool. Okay, this is my most recent one. I wrote this last week. Nice. Um, it's called Anamnesis, which means memories of a past life. And it's cool. about, um, I turned 24 recently, which I know is still very young, but I definitely like don't feel as young as I did. So it's sort of better. Cool. Cool. He opened with a kiss, his tongue a little hors d'oeuvre before leaving for the gym. I nibbled it, suddenly overcome with ennui. Is this what it has come to? Exercising on purpose, climbing hills just to climb back down again. Sometimes I feel like a babe station girl, but no one is calling. Someone please tell me what they want me to do. Sometimes I feel like a video game character, but my player has left the room to make a cheese sandwich. Sometimes I wander aimlessly through Debenhams. I want to feel so alive. I want to own a small fusion restaurant. I want to play the tambourine in a Brian Jonestown Massacre tribute band. I would much rather dance on a pirate ship, the black and pearl drop rain bouncing like a giant's broken necklace all across the deck than answer the question, where do you see yourself in five years? Because honestly, I chiefly see myself five years ago. Like if only we could play still, how we did when we were kids. Hold your hand up to your ear, the sea is calling. I will be the mummy, and you will be the daddy, and we can make a palace of this fallen tree. We just need two bits of imagination to rub together. Sometimes I think of all the flats that I have lived in. They constitute the shape of times gone by. We mistook the city for a moon, found ourselves enthusiastically blue tacking, making bohemian palaces of whatever squat we'd landed in, inviting over friends for food, and mainly wine, chasing the summer sun to the outmost corners of the meadows, 
skirts lapping at the girl's grubby feet. Everything smelt new. Sometimes I think that I would do it all again, but shinier, like how the Renaissance redid the ancient world, or how the 90s did the 60s again, with ecstasy. The tragic thing is that I quite enjoy yoga, and I can't be fucked with techno anymore. <laughs> go. Nice. I like that a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 24, yeah, I suppose halfway between 19 and 29. Yeah, it's two very different yeah, I'm words. Like, isn't it? I'm in my late early 20s and I'm annoyed about it. <laughs> I was in my late early 20s until 29. Mm. And then I realised I was 30. There was no late 20s for me. It's just, yeah, mm. it's all right. No, yeah. it, I, I, I totally know that it's fine. I think that I have slight um, paranoia about it though because I've been doing poetry since I was 17. Yeah. So I think sometimes I feel like I, I'm I'm good or I was good because I'm young and so I think sometimes which I know that is a really kind of easy argument to pick apart but I definitely sometimes have like a slight feeling like that so I think not being 20 I'm like stressed out about it but also you know I know that it's super young I think it's I think it's more that when you first start writing you you're not weighed down by your own expectation or what you think other people's expectations will be. So you just have such freedom. You just like, you can never get it back as a writer. Can you, that first spell of writing, you just like, you don't worry about it. You just go, there's no inhibition. And then as you get older, I suppose it becomes more difficult and you think, Oh, I'll never be able to write like that again, but it's not true. And that was a brilliant poem. Um, so. Oh, I think that I'm much better now than I was then much better, yeah. but I totally yeah. know what you mean about that kind of like every time you, um, sit down to write now or at least every time I do I find it very hard to still be like playful with it like yeah. with drawing I can still just sit and draw just for my own entertainment but with writing I it comes with all this kind of weight of like people might read this other people will see it it I've kind of forgotten how to write just for myself that's I think that's the most important lesson you can learn in it like writing for yourself yeah, yeah, I'm not quite there yet either. But I know exactly what you mean. You're almost picturing reading it on stage and seeing yeah. certain people in the crowd and be like, oh, yeah, no, it's mm -hmm. mad that, innit? So um, your debut pamphlet was with Polygon New Poets, right? Um, yeah. Have you got anything else uh, in the pipeline, like in the near future, or are you just sort of seeing how it goes? So things have been affected slightly by, you know, yeah. these unprecedented times. Um, I'm basically working towards my debut collection. I'd kind of thought that that would be out in like autumn this year, but I think more realistically it'll be next year sometime. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm very lucky with them. They kind of like turned up at the right time and they basically, I went for a pint with the poetry editor at Polygon and he was like, we really like you, but uh, you've not done a pamphlet yet and we feel like poets should do pamphlets before they do collections I was like okay why don't you do pamphlets and he's like well we just don't and then like three months later he emailed me and was like actually do you want to do a pamphlet so we did the pamphlet and it went very well so I, I it's not like they've commissioned me or anything but like they're my publisher so when I've done the book they'll publish it but like cool. I have to finish the book first <laughs> yeah I don't know if that sounds cool though. It's good to know that you've got something to work towards, or even if it's shifted back to next year, it's nice to. Yeah, yeah. Sort of no, I've got the direction for it. I know what it's called. I know what it's about. I am illustrating it myself as well. Oh, so I've got great. like the bones of it. Yeah. Um, what a treat. Well, mm -hmm. it's Tento. Um, would you like to read one or two more? Sure. Cool. Yeah, I've got some more here. Nice one. Time uh, flies. I... What, sorry? Time flies. God, I know. When you're sat on your sitting room floor. <laughs> okay, this is called The Night I Played Sims 2. Charles Bukowski's life was all airheaded whores who bored him and 1960s hospitals and red wine and shagging. And you can tell because he always made sure to mention it. <laughs> He wrote on typewriters before typewriters were for wankers. 
I think it might have been easier to get away with being artistic in the past, back before everything had to be enjoyed ironically. He has a poem called The Night I Fucked My Alarm Clock. And you could never get away with that kind of sincere posturing these days. But I worry that I mention cigarettes a bit too much. And last night, I just played The Sims 2 until I fell asleep. The past seems more romantic to me. There was more time to die of syphilis without Wi-Fi. <laughs> more gazing out of windows. We shall never wander through gardens dripping with ripe metaphors sighing that we must make war with France. We are not art projects. But I am in the business of romanticizing. When I look at the dark and it doesn't look back and I feel overwhelmed by insignificance, writing it nicely pokes holes in the sky so I can breathe. It is like performing to a sold out empty stadium because whatever the poets tell you, None of this really matters. A 1960s hospital is just a hospital in the 1960s. <laughs> most love affairs dribble amiably to an end. In most of Bukowski's poems, nothing actually happens, apart from a vague implication of something profound. He liked to mention typewriters, like I like to take photographs of typewriters and put them online. We are all trying to prove that we do existing devastatingly well. Knock, knock. Excuse me. I am also here. I want an aesthetically pleasing, miserable life that people are jealous of. <laughs> a life that is a good story to tell. Please stick me on the fridge where everyone can see me. Beautiful. I love that. Thanks. <laughs> Class. Oh, <laughs> yeah. It's you got to take it with a pinch of salt. And some of his. Sometimes I read his poems, and I think it's the best thing I've ever read. Sometimes I'm just like, but yeah. I'm like that with a lot of page poetry. Like, it's kind of been more my focus over the last few months, like writing the book and stuff. And so I'm like reading a lot of page poetry. I've got a few page poets kind of looking at some of my stuff for me. And yeah, I find I love a lot of page poetry, and I don't think that it has to be a completely different thing from stage poetry at all. But there mm. are definitely differences. And a lot of page poetry, I read it and I'm like, this is the wisest thing I've ever read. Like this means so much and says so little, you know. But sometimes I read them and I'm like, this is just admiring the stitching on the em emperor's new clothes, yeah. I think, yeah. you know. Like having just been at art school, some page poetry kind of reminds me of like when you go to the fine art degree show and everyone's gathered around like, an apple on the floor being like, wow, you know. <laughs> um, I hear you. Yeah. Um, well, it's just before five too, so time for one or two more if you want, whatever, whatever you feel comfortable doing. Yeah, I'm happy to do more. I mean, cool. I printed them out, so. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, this is called The Big Dark, and it's about a walk I went on. I, w I was doing a gig in Aberdeen. Uh, no, I wasn't, Inverness, sorry. And uh, we're staying at a friend's up there and we went for a walk through a forest at night time, like got drunk off of gin and tonic from his parents' alcohol cabinet that we'd put in a plastic bottle. Felt very like back in the day, but um, I wrote this. Time moves differently below the canopy. The forest roof, a cathedral's vaulted ceiling, an upturned longboat, a rib cage spurting off a spine. We entered the little nighttime underneath with reverie. It is a holy house, a hallowed hall, a mouthful of twilight. Walked deep to find the belly, wading in a waterfall I could not see my feet beneath me, sliced off at the ankle. Fish flit like spirits in an echo of the stars. At midnight, in the woodland's tummy, each step is a prayer, each stone a surprise, tapping my toes to test the earth ahead of me, blind and hearing only heartbeat in the absence of a sound. The past was a dark place. 
winter would have been a giant sleeping beast, a wood without the day dripping in, an uncracked egg. It would have eaten me up. Sometimes you look around as if life had only just occurred to you. Time moves differently. I wandered into history down a corridor of trees. One day, in a future so abstract it feels ancient, when all of this recedes to the soil, when the roots rip it up, when the forests take back what is rightfully theirs, there will be no screens spilling their pale light like waterfalls. Prometheus's gift squandered. I saw all of this as we walked, the big dark ahead of us and the big dark following behind. Wow, stunning. <laughs> it's hard to know how to finish poems on like Instagram and Zoom and stuff. I know. That's that one. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. on stage you can give a little nod, can't you, or like shut your book or whatever. But yeah, I found that yeah. it was really, it was really difficult to not finish a poem by saying cheers or thanks. Like I had to force yeah. myself to not do it. But yeah, anyway, sorry, I'm waffling. Oh no. <laughs> uh, do you want one more then? Please, yeah. If you're up for it, that'd be amazing. I've got a small one here. Um, it's called Thresholds, and I wrote it. Uh, before all of this but sort of reading it now it feels like weirdly appropriate because it's a poem sort of about a night time in a city and how everyone's like in their individual little worlds like in their flats and stuff so this is called Thresholds. Cool. It is a rickety dream dipped city blinking its evening rooms biting with a punctured silhouette of jack-o'-lantern teeth. The darkness is shining, and deep beneath the skin of sleep, the flat is damp and beating. We are wee beasties in the fat pulp of a flower's pointed heart, colour of the golden hour through an eyelid, egg yolk. The night cracks open, honeycombs, constellates the lambent households and hangs us up like ghosts to dry in arabesques sudden cobwebs. We are so many distant orbs, and somewhere, down a dream-lit lacing corridor, I lift the veil, like a bead curtain, and whisper your name. Cheers. Wow. Fantastic, that. Thanks so much for joining us. I really, really appreciate it, you giving up your time and sharing your work and stuff. Um, if people want to check you out online, are they, is it everything's at Iona Lee Poetry, isn't it? is that right? Yeah, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I have a website, but I've not paid for the domain, so it's got a stupid name. But I think you can get it on my Instagram and my Twitter. Cool. Um, it's nice to um, see you, Matt. Yeah, you too. Thanks, Thanks so much for doing it. No, thank you. Nice mm -hmm. one. See you later. Okay. Bye bye. That was Iona Lee Poetry. Uh, um, I'm looking at you. Username. That was Iona Lee, who's a wonderful poet, as you've just seen. So please check her out online. Please follow her. Um, check out her debut pamphlet, which is available through Polygon as well. Uh, next week, I'll be back at the same time, 7.30 to 8, with Stephen Lightbound, who's a fantastic poet, uh, originally from Blackburn, now based in Bristol. I first saw him perform at Shambhala Festival in the summer, and he blew me away. He's a really, really fantastic poet. So if you're watching this afterwards, please give it a share, give us a like or a subscribe or whatever. Um, and yeah, check out Iona and have a great week. See you later. Cheers.